Oi, oi, it's your boy, the Marching Tabura of These Fights Sucked, Jack Slack. It's the Jack Slack podcast, and we're coming at you on Monday, the 24th of July, following UFC at the O2 and fuck all else, because the one good boxing fight on this week, which we previewed on the boycast, not happening till Wednesday, because Japan does major fights on Wednesdays for some reason. But it does give you time to educate yourself on that and watch it. Inoue versus Fulton. Noya Inoue, obviously pound for pound great. Uh, knockout artist, tremendous. Going up in weight to fight Travis Fulton. Guy with 300 MMA fights that later turned out to be fake once he was uh, in jail for being a paedophile. It's going to be fantastic. But this UFC card, it was basically just the Tom Aspinall showcase. Let's do the main event first because it, it was a piece of piss to preview and it was a piece of piss to watch. Um, Martin Tabura in a weird situation because I consider him a bum in my mind because he doesn't really have any notable skills and uh, he just lumbers towards people and abs- absorbs shots and looked terrible even against like Greg Hardy but on the other hand he was 8-1 and one going back to 9 fights ago um, so yeah you don't have to be good to be a good heavyweight <laughs> if, if you did have to be good to be a good heavyweight There'd only be five heavyweights at any time in the world. And they need to earn a living beating up these scrubs. So um, from the get-go, you saw exactly what I said in the preview. He stands like he doesn't know which leg he needs to put forward. Um, Just lumbering between one stance and the other. Aspinall's in in and out. He he did clip him with a couple of counter shots because Aspinall was very... I mean, this is the thing. Now people are putting up clips of these... Aspinall coming in with a one, two, three leaning back, coming in with a 1-2 again, and getting hit on the chin because his chin's up in the air and people are like, oh my God, his chin's up in the air. He'll be dead against Sergei Pavlovich. And you're like, have you seen Sergei Pavlovich fight? Or Stipe Miocic, the guy that we're supposed to say is the best of all time at heavyweight. Or Fedor Emelianenko, the guy who's actually the best of all time at heavyweight. Um, chin up in the air while swinging is... It's kind of like if you left a pie on the windowsill with the window slightly ajar on the third floor of an apartment building, and you were like, whoa, I don't know, a bird might poo on it, might just slip it in through the crack there. And it's like, yeah, it could, but the chances are it won't. The opening's there, but are there any birds that do that, that come in and and shit at a slight angle? Are there any heavyweights who actually catch people with good counterpunches rather than just panic and cover up when people do shit like that? I mean, Martin Tabura did catch him with a couple of uh, counterpunches, and they didn't really matter. Um, but yeah, you saw what I really liked. Well, first they opened with a high kick as if to say, look at my shiny new knee. All my CLs are back in line, my ACL, my MCL and the other one. And then he threw a lovely right front kick to the body later. Heavyweights being kicked in the belly. They don't like it. Having a bigger belly does not make you immune to being kicked in the belly. In fact, it, it makes you more likely to hate being kicked in the belly. But then there was a lot of what I like to call false entries, which I really liked. It's a type of fake or feint um, where you step in with your lead foot a little bit, drop your weight a little bit, and then you don't move. As if to step in and then you don't step in. And um, these were really important in one of the prelim fights that we'll talk about later. But false entries are fantastic because people who don't have, certainly very early on in a fight when people don't have the full read, uh, they'll react to more, uh, they'll react to less convincing feints. You don't have to get as close to the guy. You don't have to show what your jab or your cross or whatever really look like because they haven't seen it yet. You know, it takes a while to get your, your eye in, and it takes an eye, a while to get comfortable um, with range and with just being in there. So false entries work really well early on, uh, but they work especially well if you've got guys trying to uh, counter early. And also if you've got guys trying to calf kick you all the time, false entry, step back, they're going to swing and miss, and then you can come in afterwards and, and beat them up. But a false entry, like any feint, the the effects of it are... Well, you can't decide what the effect of it is, but it'll be one or two things. They'll either overreact as if the feint's real, or they'll go, I'm not reacting to that, and they'll sit on their hands whenever you show it, which means that you can then go into real offence uh, with them being a beat behind, because they're waiting to see what's real or, or isn't. The desire to not be made to look a fool and swinging at air and so on. Um, so there were lots of nice false entries from, from Aspinall, and then he was able to get in with real shots immediately afterwards, moving really well across the floor. I mean, it was another one-and-a-half-minute fight or whatever. So, you know, the things that we do need to see tested, we're not seeing tested. Um, 
But that's not his fault because Martin Tabura's one strength is that he stays in there for a while. People don't smoke Martin Tabura like that. Oh, sorry, the, the finishing blow was, or the finishing sequence was a, a lunging in il- elbow and then a 1-3-2 as uh, Tabura was reeling. It was fantastic. Or a 3-1-2, I forget which. But left hook to jab or jab to left hook, and that worked really well. Um, yeah. Blew the doors off. Don't expect Martin Tabura to ever get a, he- a main event again because he's not a main event fighter. But do expect him to hang around the heavyweight top 10 just being boring. So people are now like Tom Aspinall versus Sergei Pavlovich needs to happen because that will be the assumed heavyweight championship of the world because John Jones is in this situation where he's not actually going to be doing heavyweight champion things. He's going to be fighting Steve Emiocic, who's been out for three years, looked washed for two years before that. All three DC fights, the second Ungani fight did not look good. Um, but some people, you know, this is the thing. This is what Matt, what Matt is generally when you're promoting a fight is the wider audience. And the wider audience is like, oh my God, it's the goat versus the goat. <laughs> when, you know, if you've been paying attention, you're like, yeah, it's, it's John Jones who's won one fight in the last four years versus Steve Miocic who has been basically retired this entire time and didn't look good before he left. If you were doing John Jones against someone, you'd want to see John Jones versus Sergei Pavlovich, who's, I think, pretty much consensus number one contender now, um, and Tom Aspinall, you know, interesting up-and-coming heavyweights uh, who you want to see in title fights, but that ain't what they're doing. So basically what's happening is like a Bisping GSP thing. It's like the title's sort of on hold because he's going on this fight, but the guy who wins has no intention of continuing from that fight. So the belt will then go to the winner of presumably Aspinall versus Pavlovich, which sounds like a great fight to me. As good a fight as you can make at heavyweight nowadays. Even with Pavlovich being as sloppy as he is and um, Aspinall being as untested as he is. So your co-main event was Molly McCann versus uh, Julia Stolyarenko, who God knows they were trying to get to lose this one. Uh, you know, she's she was one and five in the UFC before that. this with a, a submission over Jessica Rose Clark. But Molly McCann, she's been all right. You know, she's not a world beater. There was, there's a lot of schadenfreude when she loses. And people were, uh, you know, she shouldn't be in a co-main event. She shouldn't be that high up the card. Um, but she's passable. You know, you watch her fights with people like Priscilla Cachuera. She Sometimes her boxing's all right. But uh, Stolyarenko won. I do still consider her a bit of a bum. But she did give a really good account of herself, I felt. Um, and two, Molly McCann just fell hook, line and sinker for it. Because Stolyarenko coming down in weight, very tall for the weight class compared to McCann. And she's using the jab and the inside low kick. She's not known as a striker at all, but she's using them and she's annoying Molly McCann. And Molly McCann's trying to throw big counter shots. And Molly McCann, you know, she never finished anyone before um, that Carolina fight back in 2022. Uh, when was her last finish before that? 2016. And yeah, so she just never finished anyone. And now she's like, I'm a finisher. So she's overswinging on everything she throws at Stolyarenko. Missing because Stolyarenko is tall and using long weapons and getting back out of the way. And then um, Stolyarenko did a beautiful job of just getting her into counter swinging. Because one of the cameras was going, well, I've got to swing hard over the top when she jabs. And then she tried and uh, Stolyarenko dropped, dropped on a takedown instead. She tried to do that outside hook double leg, didn't work. Um, and that should have been bad for her. Because anytime you're doing a double leg and you fall to your knees and then you're on your knees, as we're talking about with like Jailton Almeida, not great wrestling. If you if you hear really good wrestlers talk about it, it's always like you want to run back up to your feet and then run through them. But she did manage to consolidate, get on top, uh, and then go over an over the back arm bar, which is very judo esque. But uh, I think she's a Roger Gracie black belt, isn't she? Didn't she say she lived like down the road? <laughs> she was being billed as like the foreigner, um, but. She, uh, yeah, over the back arm bar is where you, you, you see it in judo all the time. You, you go from on their back, swinging your leg over their head. Um, so like the back of your, so your knee goes over the back of their head and their, the top of your shin basically pushes their head down while you're turning. And you either get the arm bar like on your side while looking back at their legs while they're on all fours, or they roll over the top as Molly McCann did here, hit the fence while she was rolling. But the, the, if you look at the arm bar, I've seen some people say that the arm bar only went on because Molly McCann rolled or something like that. Didn't seem to be the case because um, Stolyarenko had a good pinch with her thighs. And if you watch, the pressure comes on before McCann gets into the role, basically. 
And this lass was smiling when she had when she felt the tension in it. She started smiling, and then the taps came, and she's just like gleeful. It was I mean it was really nice to see her so happy because um, you know God knows no one else in the world cared about this fight at all. Well, actually, I don't know. Maybe maybe the McCann fan base is still a thing. I hope Barstool did sign her to like a six-figure deal and they can't back out of it because that'd be fantastic. Always up to watch large companies fuck up to the benefit of people who've been earning nothing as fighters. I mean, that's the whole one championship project. Steal from uh, venture capitalists and give it to pro fighters while selling no tickets and losing all the money. So other good stuff on this card... There are a couple of good fights and there are a couple of good performances, but most of this card, an awful lot of this card was dirge. Um, you know, Daniel Marcos lost, well, won a decision over David Grant. Home judges managed to give the wrong guy the decision, not the British guy. Um, but David Grant, you know, that was not a great fight. I don't think David Grant did enough to be super angry about it. It's just Daniel Marcos has looked bad in both his wins so far in the UFC. Um, Jai Herbert versus Perez Zan- Oh, my God. I said Jai Herbert and uh, Mark Casey would turn up in D1 mode again because their book, this is the way that the, the UFC books the London cards now or the UK cards. Same seven fighters. Some of them aren't exciting and a lot of them won't be in exciting fights. <laughs> I mean, you know, Mark Casey and Jai Herbert stunk out the joint last time with their cage wrestling because they both needed a win and they played it super safe. But Jai Herbert came back here and he was winning when they exchanged on the feet. And then he'd go, right, I want that body lock. And he couldn't get the guy off his feet with the body lock. So <laughs> Zion was the one who managed to get him off his feet. And Herbert did a good job getting back up. But yeah, just why keep doing this? Just strike. You, you were doing well. Stri- I mean, that's that's on his corner, not telling him. You're doing well in the striking. The clinch work doesn't seem to be working. We don't want it to be this close. So do some more striking. But he didn't and he lost. And um Honestly, good. I mean, he's very, very talented, Jai Herbert, I believe, personally, having watched uh, his Cage Warriors fights and his UFC fights. And um, he fights in a way that's just not accentuating his talents at all. Now, granted, he's in um, Leon Edwards' camp and Leon Edwards is in his corner. And obviously that camp has made Leon Edwards into a killer by teaching him to wrestle. um, Or, you know, uh, his clinch work has made him a killer. But... Herbert's clinch work isn't there yet. What Herbert has is a one-two and a great high kick. Like a really good one-two. And he's just not using it. And then the other Brit wrestler was uh, Mark Tukhese. This guy came into the UFC as a super exciting striker. Lost a couple of fights and then he's like, I'm going to learn to wrestle. Comes out in the knee straps. Every time I say it, I'll be like, oh my God, knee straps, Mark Tukhese. But he came out and they, they didn't show below his waist for the entire entrance. <laughs> I was going, you know, me, me and some lads on Twitter are just going, oh, oh, and then they pat out and he's got the knee pads on and you're like, oh, it's going to be a bad one. <laughs> but he's fighting John Alvarez, who has a 0% takedown defense rate in the UFC. He has been taken down any time someone touches his legs. And you, so that was, you know, it was an obvious, damn, Jacasey, you're going to have an easy time here doing your usual shit. But fair play to him. The first round, they struck. And Alvarez looked better, and Mark Casey was spinning stuff and looking really slow for a 30-year-old. I was like, this guy was super athletic and fast a couple of years ago. Uh, it was like he spent so long training the grappling mini games on UFC career mode that his uh, striking decayed completely. But I did say fair play to him. You know, Someone must have spoken to him backstage and said, do not stink up this card as well or we're going to stop inviting you. Uh, and then second round, he comes out and immediately starts wrestling again. <laughs> Takes John Alvarez down in the opening seconds. Three minutes in, he's on top still. Hasn't thrown a single strike. I was just losing my mind. Uh, and then Alvarez got up and they clashed heads. And Chikese told the ref. And it, this ref, the British guy, I see him all the time. I don't know his name. He's shite. He just looks like he's confused all the time. But he goes, uh, it's legal. And then they continue, and Alvarez gets the dust choke from the top. But uh, and actually, you got to see Mulder Casey doing like the starfish spreading out. As we're always talking about, people ask me like, "Well, how do you deal with the dust?" And one of the ways is just to starfish, uh, because you know you're putting yourself in a not very athletic position by 
going face down and spreading all your limbs out. The old Greco-Roman parterre. Greco-Roman is the most boring sport in the world to watch. It, you know, if you watch a Greco-Roman highlight on YouTube, you're going to get some big throws. But if you watch a Greco-Roman tournament like the Olympics, uh, as I did when I went to London 2012 and watched half of the weight classes in the Greco-Roman, um, no one scores takedowns in Greco-Roman. So what happens is they start a parterre period and one guy goes full belly down starfish and the other guy can't do anything. And the reason that Carolyn was so great, I've been watching all the Carolyn I can find lately, can't find a single fucking takedown he scored. <laughs> it's just when the parterre starts, he gets his hand locked underneath the guy and picks him up and they can't do anything about it. But if you're in a DAS, go Greco-Roman parterre, just go flat belly out. Um, but one of the things that the guy can do, as Joel Alvarez did here, is start sliding in for what's sometimes called a sliding dance or a slas or a mass. That was a big Jeff Glover thing, like making a uh, variations of the ass sound, but with things on the start of it. But the ass sound was what this fight was, and by the ass sound I mean... <laughs> but I do feel for Jacquesi here because the headbutt did cost him the fight, and the ref didn't see it and said he didn't see it. And then afterwards they were reviewing footage, apparently, the cage side officials and Mark Ratner. Um, and they just went, no, actually, no. And the best part is that the UFC, I believe the UFC is still the commission for themselves in London. So they could do that. They could overturn it. But, you know, they didn't want to. Also means, who the fuck does Mark Casey appeal to? I would like to see a scenario where appeals over UK fight results have to be argued while wearing a powdered wig. But uh, other good fights on this card. Ooh, scraping the barrel here now. Um, oh, sorry, Nathaniel Wood versus Andre Feely. That was the good fight on this card. That deserved fight of the night, and they didn't give it fight of the night, which did my fucking head in. But Nathaniel Wood, great fun always. I, I spent half of the um, preview boycast talking about this fight because I knew this one would be a good one and I didn't really care about the main event or the co-main or half the other stuff on here. But Nathaniel Wood came out, started low kicking and Andre Feely showed very quickly that he had the read on it. Because if you watch the very like first minute of the fight, Andre Feely lands about three or four straights down the center on Nathaniel Wood as he's throwing low kicks. And one of them drops him. Just quickly, just a little stumble. Nothing like the dropping in round two. But um, yeah, and Feely had a really good read on it. And Nathaniel Wood had to go to the boxing more and, and set things up. And what I really liked about this fight was it's one of those things about the dynamic of it when you can tell that two fighters are very high level, but they've also got a read on each other because the things that they do against everyone else aren't quite working as cleanly as as when they're you know when they're in this fight. Um, so would the low kicks get encountered? Andre Philly is throwing up the high kicks and getting cut kick underneath by Nathaniel Wood, getting kicked in the standing leg. Uh, he's he's throwing his um, he's throwing his long straight punches and, and hooks are coming back following them. Nathaniel Wood kept throwing his right front kick to the body and uh, he'd poke it. And then as his foot came back, it was like if you got your, your um, it was like if you got the bottom of your trousers caught on a piece of barbed wire or something like that. He looked really surprised that it wasn't coming back clean because Feely would grab the foot every time. So at every point, these guys were looking sharp, but making the other guy's job difficult. And I really enjoyed that. But Wood stole round one by landing a beautiful outside slip to right hand across the top counter, uh, something that he does quite a lot. He does it off that um, pressing in on people with his very, very high guard, where his body's sort of exposed, but he has his elbows nice and high. And uh, he'll take a step back and either pull or just dip off to his right side and then throw his right hand over the top. Uh, and sometimes the opponent won't throw, they'll just fake at him. But if they're still standing there afterwards, he can come back with the right hand anyway. Uh, it's a really nice little move, and especially out of like little clinch exchanges and things. He did it to um, Jordan. He, uh, they were in real tight, hitting each other with body shots and trying to hit trips and things. And then he just stepped back, pulled, and then came back in with the right hand. And Jordan just stood there and took it. Um, but that outside slip right hand across the top is a... I mean, I always reference Roberto Duran, but that's that was one of his signature punches. Uh, getting the, the jab and... Um, we always talk about the jab and dip with Duran, but he did a couple of different things off his jab. So if you watch the first round of any sort of older Duran fight, he's doing jab and dip, jab and slip to the left, and jab and slip to the right with the intention that whenever he jabs, something's going to come back at him. 
And if he then spots that something has come back at him and he's already out of the way, he pitches a punch back over the top. So the jab and dip, he comes up with a left hook or whatever. But the jab and slip to his right, he'd then come back with the right hand. He also used to do a jab and pivot behind his um, around his lead leg behind his lead shoulder. So he'd jab into sort of a shoulder roll and come back with the right hand. It was Those were the two big ones for him landing his right hand. But this counter that Wood used against Andre Feely, it's the big one that he was landing on Iran Barkley, or Iran Barkley, sorry, which is a, a terrific fight. If you've never seen that, Duran's like 40 years old. He's gone up two weight classes. He's just fat. <laughs> and, uh, and he's fighting Iran Barkley, who cuts an arm and a leg to make weight. He's enormous. And I believe at this point he's knocked out Tommy Hearns twice, or at least once. And everyone's going, at some point, Duran, this larking about has to stop and you have to retire. And uh, Duran puts a beating on him. Takes some great shots, too. He gets he gets a left hook on the chin that turns him all the way around. Um, but, yeah, it's an outside slip to right hand across the top of the jab. He does it in the first uh, first or second round and hurts him. And then in the eighth, he scores the knockdown with it. And that's a big thing in the scorecards and gets him the entire fight. Um, so that was good. Wood knocked him down with it and stole the round. Second round, Wood's trying to press in and, and land uh, some punching combinations. And Feeney clips him and hurts him. And immediately Wood covers up again. But one of the things about the one of the things about the high forearms cover up is that guys can grab around it, just grab your head, and that's doubly bad if you've got a taller opponent. So Feely grabbed a double collar tie, I think, over Wood's arms, and just started hammering in knees, which is a really bad spot to be in. And I think he dropped Wood, or Wood dived on a leg, or something like that. But he ended up like running around to Wood's back, and Wood had one arm inside the legs. Something that uh, Eduardo Tellez used to do a lot in, in uh, pure grappling was like he'd go to the turtle and then he'd reach and grab inside your leg. So you were basically, he was like putting you in a crucifix or, or putting you into a crucifix on him. Um, you, so yeah, what he'd do is like then people would roll through for the crucifix and he'd scramble out of it. But one of the great things is that if the guy hops on your back and his leg is over your arm and your arm's not pressed flush to your body, but a, your elbow's away from your body. Um, you, you can just shuck him off or you can start to shuck him off. So Feely got into this position where he was on, on Wood's back, but he was tr- having to try and control. He couldn't really strike and he couldn't really... He did. A, he switched off to an arm bar, which looked really cool. He was going... I thought we were going to see a back uh, a back triangle like um, John, Giancarlo Bodoni. He did, I think, two of them at ADCC this year, the, uh, the back triangle slash arm bar. But Wood managed to scramble up out of it and, and he managed to shake off the cobwebs and... and uh, Staying for the rest of the round. And then the third round, it just sort of turned into a sparring contest because Feely took his foot off the gas. And Wood, while he wasn't like trying to take Feely's head off, he was landing loads of low kicks. And those were the low kicks that Feely was punishing earlier on. And Feely was just sort of happy to let them slap his legs. And by the midpoint of the round, they flashed up the stats and Wood had landed like twice as many strikes in that round. Even though watching it, you were thinking, ah, neither one's really hurting the other that much. But yeah, Wood was definitely landing more. Uh, well, more shots, and I suppose the significant shots, the only really significant ones, were the uh, the low kicks, and then he did a little poke to the body and a, it doubled up with a left hook upstairs, which was really nice too. But yeah, really good fight. Um, and the reason that I knew this was going to be a good fight for the start is that Nathan- Nathaniel Wood's on a great tear. He's become really something lately. And Andre Feely is a great fight for anyone. He's a very tricky customer. You know, he's the best, he's easily the best striker that's ever come out of alpha male, but he's also got really solid wrestling because he's nothing like the, you You know, that team is all bricked up midgets. <laughs> it's, it's all small roidy boys. And Andre Fili is a, a long slender boy um, who loves his switch hitting and his long hitting, but has obviously been having to deal with people trying to take him down constantly. And especially as like the tall long guy on that team against a load of guys who are good at timing shots underneath you. That's, uh, you know, he's, he's going to have to, he's going to have been working his ass off. So he's got a very interesting style. He just, the results aren't coming as, he's going to be another one of those ones where in 10 years time, people are gonna be, people who know are going to be like, Andre Fili was really fucking good, but the results are probably not going to say that or the record's probably not going to say that. Then the Roe Murphy versus Josh Kudabau was um, decent. Yeah, it wasn't too bad. Not the best showing for Leroy Murphy because he is such a hyped prospect. Um, But, you know, he had his moments. Um, There was a nice sequence in the end of round one or round two, which was he got Kudabau towards the fence. He threw a right high kick to stop Kudabau circling. He threw a one, two, three, two, or one, two, three, and then an overhand or something like that. Chinned him and then ended on his um, 
waist and started working for a, a locked hands double leg. And I was like, that's just, you know, I mean, it was almost the Jackson Wink classic run through the regional scenes techniques. But if you were going to take someone and just try to get them through a, a amateur level MMA fight or whatever and win, um, cut the cage, throw a high kick, enter with a, a hard hands combination and then go for the locked hands double off the cage is, is a great um, sequence of events. Great way to force yourself on the opponent. Didn't get the locked hands double because Kulabau switched legs and he ended up grabbing the lead leg and Kulabau was going for a, a Kimura trap, which is where you get the Kimura over the top of the guy's head and then you sit down or you or you throw your legs out in front of you and sit down and you so they're pointing up at the ceiling basically and you enter a, a sort of scramble that it, it's a controlled scramble. The guy will come up, try and come up on top of you, but you can go to his back in the process or attack the arm. Um, the Kimura trap is a really useful thing and we talk about it quite often because uh, Corey Sanhagen makes great use of it but it's a great way of turning a wrestling exchange into a grappling exchange so if you can get a guy to go for the single leg which you know if you're good at um, feeding the single you can turn double legs into single legs by just making it more attractive to the guy say ah, it's a lot of work to finish that double because I'm standing in a very bladed sort of side on stance do you want to have this single leg and then when they go for the single leg you go for the Kimura trap over the top um, you do have to sort of get them to drop their head a bit so it's very useful in fence wrestling exchanges where guys just are, you know, tunnel vision borrowing in on the leg. Uh, whereas if a guy's out in the open and he's picking up a single leg and he's keeping his head in your chest, like the classic listen to their heartbeat sort of single leg, um, it's harder to get because you can't reach over the top of them. But he was going for this Kimura trap and Le- Lerone Murphy, go watch this sequence again because it's so, I don't think I've ever seen it. It was really cool. Leroy Murphy reaches between Kudabao's legs, grabs one of uh, Kudabao's wrists and pulls it away so that the Kimura grip is no longer in place. And then he's holding one... Ba- basically, he's got like... Do you remember Road Dog used to do the pump handle slam? That was that was such a shit finisher, but that was his finisher in um, the WWF. And it's where you get the guy's leg and you pull it... Sorry, you get the guy's arm and you pull it between his own legs. And Leroy Murphy had that for a moment and then he hit him with a really nice knee in the face while he was sort of pulling him pulling him out between his own legs um don't think i've ever seen that happen in mma yet before i'll make a clip of it and i'll put it on twitter but Ray Murphy was getting clipped with a, count- a couple of counter shots because it was a southpaw versus orthodox matchup the lead hook was surprising him and this was happening all all up and down the card i mean marching to caught um tom aspinall with one but I mean, Brian Barberino was getting chinned with them all the time, but he was also looking for them and sort of selling out on them. So Muradov would come in and uh, whichever one was Southpaw, I can't remember, but Muradov would come in, Barberino would land the lead hook over the top and then stand there while Muradov's next punch came through and hit him clean. Um, But Leroy Murphy got stunned by one in this one, uh, which was quite telling. However, the last round was basically won by a body kick that just... Flicked him with the toes. You you wouldn't even... I mean, some of these, you wouldn't even believe that they're real. But I've seen enough of them that, you know, it's just it's just unfortunate. If, if a guy whips his leg through and the only thing that just catches you is the end of them, it, it can still fuck your day up. Uh, and poor old Koulibaly fell to the mat. And most of that round was just Leroy, Mur- Leroy Murphy getting on his back and, try- and controlling him and looking for a submission. And even when he got back to his feet... I think he got back to his feet, didn't he? But even when he was... Um, out of the bad position, he didn't look like himself. He looked like he'd been really hurt. But he gave a good account of himself. Speaking of good accounts, um, Paul Craig versus Andre Muniz. Fun enough fight. I thought Paul Craig, he's looking better on the feet. Um, uh, this sort of started around like the Shogun fight. You know, I was watching him. I don't think he'll ever have hands. I, he just doesn't seem to have the ability to move his hands with force. But I do think that, um, you know, comfort under fire cannot be overstated its value, even for a guy who just wants to grapple. Because if you can slip punches comfortably, you can enter body locks. And, you know, in, in grappling and wrestling and things, you have to fight tooth and nail to get body locks or to get a good underhook. Uh, people don't want to give them to you. And it's true in MMA. People don't want to give you a good underhook or a good body lock. Um, but they will by throwing hands at you and opening up. So if Paul, honestly, the better Paul Gray gets at p- convincing people that he's terrified of punches and still slipping them, 
the better. I used to like his kick heavy game because kicks and frames is a, is a legitimate uh, game plan for someone who doesn't have good hands. Uh, you know, John Jones has made a whole career out of kicks and frames. Al Jermaine Sterling is great at kicks and frames. If you use your hands defensively, so you keep your shoulders tucked up, you, you're putting your hands out on their shoulders or over their shoulders, and your shoulder you're rolling down behind your your own shoulders. Um, that, that's all good. But another way you can use kicks is to get people swinging at you. And if he can use these kicks, especially like the body kick and the high kick, to rattle people and get them rushing in on him, he can duck under, get clinches, and start running through people. And I, the the takedown on Muniz, I didn't really see what happened because the the filming of it seemed to be like entirely from the waist up. But he got a body lock and he just sort of ran through him. When he did get to the um, to the mount, um, the thing that you noticed was that then he started punching and he couldn't punch with any power. And then he started elbowing and you're going, fucking hell, he's, he's tearing him wide open. It's just like the more joints you add to something, the more complicated it becomes as an action. Um, elbows, especially elbows from mount, because it's just bringing your upper body's weight down, There's you, know, you don't have to coordinate extending your arms or whatever. You're just falling down on your elbow. People can, can learn to do that really well. I mean, the one that everyone learns really well, I don't think I've ever seen anyone... I don't think I've ever seen anyone taught this and not be able to do it decently hard on a heavy bag. Uh, you know, if you put a heavy bag on the floor and you mount it, the frame elbow, the, uh, who, who invented that? I think it was, um, Jeremy Horn was famous for it, but you push the opponent's face with your hand, you straighten your arm out, and then you just let your hand slide off and fall onto your elbow. And that one, you can keep teach people very quickly to put good weight into and that was what it was like here. He just tore him to shreds by dropping elbows on him. But it's crazy because five seconds earlier, he was throwing the most pity patter punches you've ever seen. And you're going, oh, I don't know if he's actually going to be able to take advantage of being in the mount here. So good for Paul Craig. Um, I think it's a move in the right direction because I, I was questioning the move down because I said, you know, his problems have been takedowns. Being a bigger, stronger man will help that. But equally, his other problem has been like taking a shot. And that could be that could be because he's dealing with massive light heavyweights who are really just heavyweights who cut weight. So the athletic heavyweights. Um, or it could be his chin, and chins typically get worse if you dehydrate yourself. But he took some decent shots in this one. He didn't look like he was lost. Um, so, yeah, very excited for middleweight Paul Craig. I mean, God, I wish they'd stop trying to get me excited about middleweight. It's just it's a, such an annoying weight class because as soon as you find someone, you're like, oh, that's quite exciting. And then they just lose in the most. In it, They always lose in a fashion that really displays that they aren't that good. Generally, <laughs> you know, people like Chris Curtis, someone comes out and circles to his right and you're like, fuck, he, he doesn't know how to deal with that. He's got 45 fights and he's never had to deal with that. Johnny Parsons versus uh, Danny Roberts was good fun. They gave this fight of the night, but Danny Roberts, I've seen him do good work against Mike Perry. He was landing good one-twos, and then he'd stand there, and Perry would get him on the on the rebound. He was landing the first shot, beating him to the punch every time, and then getting caught afterwards. But in this one, he got really just daft with it. He keeps throwing right hook, left hook. And the way he throws his hooks, he it's like he tenses up all his muscles to throw a hook, and that just slows you down, and then you'll lose power as a result. But right hook, left hook, right hook, left hook just isn't fooling anyone. And it got worse when he got hurt because then he was like, I'm going to swing back as hard as I can. So he threw a six punch combination to try and get Parsons off him. And then Parsons hit him on the chin with like a jab and dropped him again. <laughs> it's just uh, when he gets hurt, because he doesn't have the best chin anyway, but when he gets hurt, he goes, I'm going to fight my heart out now. And you're like, just be a coward. Just grab him and stick to the fence. You know, there's, there's no points for being a hero there. I mean, maybe you get a couple more fights in the UFC than you would have if you got losses, if you were exciting. But he's decently talented. He could he could make a good run in the middle of this division. But he's just, um, his chin is a bit suspect and he fights in a way where if he gets dinked even a little bit, he's like, well, I'm going to fight with my chin on a platter now. But Parsons was fun. I really enjoyed him. Um, Again, his left hook against Danny Roberts is southpaw stance, another one here. Uh, and then he did the most cringe call out of Paddy Pimblett ever. Uh, but you know, I hope he gets that fight. That'd be fun. You know, he's not particularly great. I, oh, fuck, this is uh, welterweight. Yeah, man, reaching to try and get a fight with a lightweight. But he did look small, so, you know, there's that. 
Mick Parkin versus Jamal Pogues was boring as hell, but at least Mick Parkin looks like in form. He looks good as a heavyweight. You're looking at it and going, yeah, it's sharp enough. I'm not blown away. And he's certainly not like running rings around Jamal Pogues, who is just a fat, light heavyweight. Um, yeah, you know. Ketlin Vieira versus Pani uh, Kianzad was, was actually decently fun at watching Ketlin Vieira um, grapple all over her. One thing that I did notice was she'd get uh, half guard a lot and she'd uh, try and put her arm over the back and, and advance position. Gordon Ryan style. But her grappling does not open up opportunities to strike very much. She's very much like hugging the opponent and sticking to him and trying to advance and arm triangle choke and things like that. Whereas you watch like uh, Drickus Duplessis the other week, the combination of the darts and the elbows, that's grappling and striking playing into each other perfectly. Because the darts, you want to crumple them in and they're going to straighten their back and they're going to freak out and try and push away from you. And the moment they do, they're there for the elbow and you can just keep elbowing them. And when they want to crunch up in a ball or to get away from the elbows, they're back in the darts. And then the other good fight that I really enjoyed was Jafel Filio versus um, Daniel Berez. Um, Berez's bodywork, mint. Uh, but especially from the in the very early going, he knew that Jafel, well, maybe he didn't know, he knew that Jafel, he knew that Jafel Filio was an MMA fighter. So he knew that he'd be looking for the calf kick. So he did a couple of face, false entries and Filio swings and misses by a mile and Berez can step in on him. And, you know, it's such a great way to open a fight because... A false entry costs you nothing. You just go, am I coming in? No, I'm not. And it can cost them everything. Yeah. And there's some good body shots and things. Yeah, it was just a lovely fight. Really enjoyed it. Berez lost, but I was impressed by what he did. I loved how when, after he dropped him with a body shot, he had him up again and he shoved him and stepped into the left body kick, which is great. The double-handed shove to body kick or high kick works so well because you are pushing the guy off balance and even if his hands are in the way of where your kick's going, because he's off balance, his hands will be doing weird adjustments anyway. If you, I mean, just try this with someone or have someone do this to you. Just shove you, and your hands will immediately move without you wanting to wanting them to. You know, it's very, very hard to stay in a strong guard while being pushed off balance. Have I touched on everything interesting on that card? I think I have, yeah. So, um, yeah, that was the card that was. We'll be back in the uh, middle of the week to talk about UFC 29, we 291 or 292? 291, yes. And everything going on there, it's at uh, Elevation in Salt Lake City. So basically, everyone's getting finished in the first round the moment they gas. Or we're getting some terrible three-round fights. But we'll be talking about it on the boycast. I'll probably write something this week too. Um, if you want to get in on all that, sign up to the Patreon, support the podcast, be a boy. Uh, if you want to send an email to the podcast, jackslagpodcast at gmail.com. And uh, if you want to see what I'm writing at any time, fightprimer.com. I am your boy. Actually, while I remember, go read Advanced Striking 2.0, Dustin Poirier. It's free. You can go read it right now. It's all about the hillbilly shoulder roll. I'm your boy, Jack Slack. Jesus Christ, Tony Ferguson's on this card. Get ready to be sad. Bless.